let me introduce myself i am saumya i am a postdoctoral fellow uh, working associated with uh, this group uh, basically i am from a biological background where i have done my bachelor's and masters in biotechnology and uh, my uh, phd was on um, using bacteria how to remediate uranium particularly so uh, i think for the past few months you have not seen me because i was in uh, portugal i was uh, uh, euphorates erasmus fellow there uh, working in a biochemical engineering so in my last lecture we have uh, discussed on biotechnology its various applications and we uh, discussed on dna the genetically modified organisms how bio geo technology is related and bio geo interface and biology biology and its application that is biotechnology and collaboration of bio and geotech that is bio geo technology and with this i understand that you might have come to know the importance of interdisciplinary research in today's world in solving today's problem so with this um when i say biogeo technology it includes both the fundamental and the applicative research so the fundamental research usually how the microbes can affect uh, your soil structure um how it can change your the uh, geotech properties like the um pore size and suction all these comes in the fundamental so fundamentals of bio uh, and in geotech like how what kind of microbes are present in one kind of environment so when you take a soil from here and when you take a soil from outside uh, mumbai it is completely different and inside mumbai itself or inside the campus when you take a soil from this region and when you go to some dump yard or where you throw all your dust it might be a different organism so studying that how they interact how they survive how they change the soil structure so these comes with fundamental studies so and the applicative how you use these organisms for some changes changing the geotechnical properties like um, and when you use it for uh, the micp i think we had four five lectures on micp for bioremediation self healing uh, 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 buildings you have now where you have the uh, um, micp itself what is used there so uh, they seal the uh, cement bio cementation bio clogging all these comes under the applicative research so today in my today's lecture i will i have because we studied micro 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 i think if you have attended my last lecture you can uh, come to know why we take microbes uh, especially microbes uh, so because it is very small you won't be able to see the microbes have you seen yes yes it has a very small genetic structure so because of that we go for microbes not uh, uh, we take we have the last time we have also discussed about the uh, sunf sunflower plant where a professor itself has i uh, used it in a project to uh, remediate some contaminant so you go for plants also but especially a study of microbes because it is easily re reproducible the life span is small so you take up microbes so today in today's lecture i will explain to you what are the steps we as a biotechnologist we study or we uh, the protocol what we follow to uh, take to select a particular organism now today if you have some area which is contaminated with lead for example or with plastic so you go to a my, uh, biotechnologist or a microbiologist or some some consultancy comes to you so we have this zone which is contaminated so what do you do next so you say okay we can I, and that person want to use some a um, microbial eco friendly method not a chemical method so what do you do next so uh, you isolate an organism and there are steps which has to be followed so i will give an overview of that i it's just a brief step i won't be going into the much detail so so first step is the sample collection what do you mean by sample collection you are very well versed with sample collection as a 
uh, geotechnologist, I feel. So why is a sample collection necessary? So in case of uh, the same thing applies in bio also. So and here particularly you go for sample collection because someone comes with a problem with lead as I said there is con lead contamination. So you go for a region which has that content. So that the organisms which is present there will have adaptability to that, will be already resistance, resistant to that. So now you see the people who are working in uh, slum areas, do you see uh, the people who work in that uh, very uh, uh, municipal, uh, these, these places where it is very dirty, you see the children, they are there in that place and they are so healthy, they are playing there, they are eating there, everything. But can you imagine one day if we go and stay there, we will be sleeping for 10 days with fever and what not, right? So that is what the resistance is. So these organisms, when a human can develop that resistance, so these organisms are already, I mean, they are very small, so they can easily adapt to that environment. So if you go to anywhere, even there are microbes which are isolated from Antarctica. So you search in the papers, you get thousands, millions of microbes from even from Antarctica. So this is the re reason why we go for the sample selection and uh, we, so if I want to work on, uh, so I will be giving example of uranium because I have worked on that. So I wanted to work or uh, have an organism which can uh, degrade uranium or which can bioremediate uranium. So in that sense, I have to have an organism which could, which I can put it in a zone where it is contaminated with organism. If I take up organism from here, from IIT Bombay and put it in the uranium contaminated zone, it just dies. So be, because it is not tolerant, so I have to select such an organism. So that is very important. So I think um, we have a gas hydrate team where even they have papers or I mean they have uh, read in the literatures where there are organisms even surviving in such environment, right? So you can just give an idea of on that. Yes. So what? You can find microbes hundreds of meters, even kilometers beneath the seabed, uh, where they decompose the organic material that was deposited with the soil uh, millions of years ago. And they, in the process of decomposition, they generate methane and carbon dioxide. And under right conditions of temperature pressure, uh, methane converts to uh, hydrate. Given the presence of water within the soil course. So in, in such an environment where you can not imagine humans surviving, you can see this surviving. So that is the adaptability of that. And particular microbe is for particular uh, environment. It is not the same for all. I think even um, Agnes has uh, some idea, some details about that which she can share. In context of municipal toilet degradation, uh, you have microbes uh, doing specific activities like for uh, degrading carbohydrates. You have a set, certain set of microbes which is acidogenic microbes, and for converting those uh, volatile fatty acids to methane and carbon dioxide, you have methanogenic uh, bac bacteria microbes. So basically, in my study, the parameters which should favor the uh, growth of microbes are pH, temperature, and moisture. These are the three crucial things. Apart from nutrients for the survival of microbes, pH, temperature, and moisture is something which decides how uh, it can reproduce or how it can perform its activity in a given conditions. Yes, yeah, so I mean, I wanted you to understand. So, what is the importance of microbes in a particular environment? With this, I think you can get an idea of that. So, when I started uh, my work. I wanted, I, as I said, I wanted a microbe which can tolerate uranium. So this is a uh, picture of the monazite sand in the southwest coast of India. So southwest coast of India, anyone know what is it famous for when I said monazite sand? So the monazite sand has got thorium, uh, uh, thorium in it. 
so uh, what the world uh, today is uh, researching on nuclear projects so in case in, instead of using uranium if we could use or uh, design a reactor where thorium can be used thorium element can be used uh, we india will be one of the strongest country because we have the largest monazite reserve in the world as of now so this so this sand it also has uranium this monazite sand so since i am from mangalore which is very near to this i first selected the site which is nearest and i started isolating the microbes from this monazite sand and to my surprise it really it could tolerate uranium whereas the other microbes couldn't and here you can see some of the research papers where See, assessing the hydrocarbon degrading potential of indigenous bacteria isolated from the crude oil tank bottom sludge. So, phosphate solubilizing uranium tolerant bacteria associated with the monazite sand of a natural background radiation site. And isolation and characterization of phosphate solubilizing bacteria from, from rhizosphere soil. So why I have put this, the phosphate solubilizing from the rhizosphere soil is for, now I am saying about metal. I mean uranium or lead and um, arsenic but in case if you want some other property you have in case the phosphate solubilizing bacteria you want or some nit nitrogen uh, solubilizing or th those kind of bacteria if you want you have to select a particular environment where that those kind of microbes are more so that's in the rhizosphere region where the plants roots are there you can find these kind of bacteria this these you come to know through the literature and preparation of uh, petroleum degrading bacteria so all these uh, kind of researches have uh, uh, research is going on and now once you select this uh, sample or once you collect the sample what you will do next so you have to grow the bacteria uh, so what what do you think what the bacteria needs to uh, grow what are the nutrients or what do you think what does it require once you provide this environment for that then it starts growing and it is different from each uh, bacteria to bacteria so some requires oxygen some die in oxygen some require a little amount and if you provide more it dies so each thing the carbon source will be different some require glucose some require maltose and what not now once you say you grow the bacteria we grow it in these kind of plates it is called as a petri plates i don't think so anyone has seen that uh, so okay so this is called as a petri plates where you pour the media so what you say it it has the carbon source it has the energy source so these media you prepare it is a liquid one where uh, with an uh, agar content when you add agar it becomes solidified so this is the nutrient plate what you prepare so it should be you should know uh, i mean keep in mind that when you are working with microbiology it ha everything has to be sterilized you cannot just use your hand and you cannot just touch it so if you use your hand and you just place it on these kind of plates where the media is next next day you will nicely find what are the what microorganisms you had your hand in on your hand so it it should be very 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 sterile so next you grow you have your media you have your plate you uh, take your sample what you have collected soil or water and then you pour it so what what do you think you will have next day you incubate it you have to have a particular temperature so what the next day you will see is this so what are these it, these are microbes it has fungus it has bacteria it has yeast everything is there in this for you to have a single isolate you cannot uh, take anything from this and you you cannot isolate anything in this if you touch one you will get uh, everything i mean uh, the next day if you take it and put it into another plate it will be completely contaminated you will get the same thing like this so you have to have there is a method what we follow it is called as a serial dilution where you can count the plate count the number of organisms number of bacteria in one gram of the sample you can see 
So this method, see here you here in the first first one you directly take your sample, you take uh, soil, you add it with water, and then you plate it on this, and you uh, have your incubation period. Usually it is 24 hours, and then you see the same plate like this. So you say it has T and T series, so too, nu too numerous to count. So for this sake, we just go on serially diluting it unless you get a plate with countable number of colonies. So that is around 25 to 250. So you just go on serially diluting it. So once you do that, you can get a plate like this where you can isolate. There are isolated colonies. You understand what I mean isolated colonies and the completely adhered colonies. So next when you do this, first you take your sample, you uh, follow this method and you uh, get this kind of play, uh, organisms in a plate. After that you have to take a single colony. See here you have seen different colors, right? You have red, you have yellow, white. So you have to take a single one and you will do this, even this is a petri plate and you isolate it until, unless, until you get this kind of single colonies. So that means it is pure. You do this for around 5-6 times you do and you get the pure colonies. And then you save it, you preserve it each one. So we have different preservation technique which I am not going for. So once you do this, have to optimize the growth conditions from for each. So once you have isolated your organism, it is it has a so you have to uh, keep it at 37 degrees Celsius, 27 degrees Celsius, and 50 degrees Celsius. Which temperature it gives the better growth? You have to see for e for pH. You have to see for the nutrients, for the carbon source, everything, and you have to finalize. So which one is the best for your organism? So this is called as the optimization of your of the growth condition for a particular bacterium. You uh, uh, for this usually in microbes we uh, see temperature, pH, and uh, your carbon source. So in that case, you will go for temperature uh, for three, four temperatures or a wider range temperatures. You just keep. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, first you start with the temperature usually, and then you go for pH. And then you go for your carbon source. So each way it is it varies. Then you finalize with one. So for so in case now tomorrow I have a new organism which can which has a very good ability to degrade plastic, and someone else want to use use that. So I have already optimized that. So you will be using the the optimized condition. So there is no reputation required. So you publish your papers, right? And as I don't know whether you have known, you know, like as our bank, we have gene banks or we have uh, the microbial culture collection center wherein if each people of you have isolated something of your own or you, your own uh, organism from sand or soil from your itself and if you feel it has something good, some good uh, characteristics, you can send it to the a culture collection center and it will be preserved. So and next time if someone wants to work on that they can use it. So there is culture collection centers like that. And after that the next step you go is for screening of specific properties. So what do you mean by screening of specific property? So here in case you want to have a part, uh, organism for a particular pH you have to use it near the, uh, the contamination is near the coastal area. So it should sustain that salt content. So you will take an organism and grow it in a, in a media which has higher salt content, whichever survives you use it. And if you want to use it for somewhere which is contaminated with lead, you take an organism and then you, you screen it for a particular property. So for example, in, in this case, it is screened for phosphate solubilization. So we wanted an organism which could solubilize, solubilize the phosphate. So usually in the nature, what you have seen, what you see is the, uh, the phosphate is in a complex form. So that's why you add 
uh, you know phosphate fertilizers, right? Urea, DAP, all these are phosphate fertilizers. Why do you use it? We, so, though we have phosphorus so, like in, uh, in abundance in the environment, we add this because the plants cannot take up the, uh, take up the phosphate directly since the phosphate is in a very complex form. So these microbes, we were working on some specific microbes, we wanted it so that it could produce the, uh, it could solubilize this bond form of phosphate so that plants could easily take it up. So for this case, we selected a media which has got a tricalcium phosphate. So tricalcium phosphate, you can see the white, white media here, it has got the tricalcium, so that those are the calciums. So the organisms which could solubilize this, you can see within 24 hours of growth, you could see the clear zone. So that means these organisms could release something which could solubilize the phosphate, which was in the bound state. So for we and in this case, it is it could these these were the different organisms, and you can see the difference. So we had put this organism in the uranium uh, containing solution and the percentage reduction you can see how the percentage like it, it was just 3.9 percent reduction after six hours of incubation in the uranium containing media whereas other organisms you can see around 45 percent reduction. So there is variation. So these were the organisms which I had uh, isolated from the monazites and what I said from coastal region, uh, uh, southwest coast of India. And once this is done, we go for taxonomic identification. So, have you heard about this? What is phylogenetic analysis taxonomic identification? That is what phylogenetic analysis or taxonomic identification means. You will find out the organism and from which family it belongs. Even organisms, they are living, so they have to have a family, right? So in this, what we do is, so this is the example of a family tree, see. So these set are belonging to one family. I, so the, there are uh, four families here, so you can see with the I mean different colors. So this is what your family tree. You can make your family tree. So in the same way, what is the uh, this? I think the tree of life. This is for all the organisms. You can see where are we? We belong here. And then you have to still ex expand this tree. Then you will see where where humans belong. You, this is just the animals. So same way we have for all the organisms what you isolate, you give them a family. So but why is it necessary? And so what does it tell if it has a common property? Uh, that's why uh, you go for a, a family or when you say, okay, for example, when you go uh, for a marriage proposal, you see, we, he is from a good family or she is from a good family. You just see that, right? I mean, you don't see, your parents will see if it is arranged. <laughs> so that's the thing. So why you go for family tree? And even these organisms have got a very, very particular characteristics each one has. So some can solubilize something, some can eat metal, some can degrade petroleum. So now, and the another important thing is now one kind of uh, in one site you will find an or a group of organism, and in another site you can find a completely different group of organism, and then you can just relate it to the evolution of. You can then later link it to the evolution of human life. So evolution of human life it starts with an with a microbe, right? So you can just see how, what were the changes it happened. So that's why it is required. I think now Agnes will be dealing with some three different kinds of leakage, leachates. And I think you can explain it more. Three different kinds of descent. Uh, like when in, as a part of my study, I'm taking leachate samples from a fresh dump yard. 
a document which was closed for two years and which has been closed for three months. So each, if you study the microbial properties or the bacterial properties in the campus, you can see everything has a different uh, microbial species present or the concentration. You can see the concentration of the microbes will be different in different conditions. So uh, if you know, suppose uh, you need in a, like uh, what we expect is in a closed landfill for longer duration, the methane concentrations uh, would be greater compared to a very fresh dump here. So a very fresh landfill. So if at all I need to in, uh, increase the production of methane in a relatively fresh or a young active landfill, I can introduce some species, corresponding species, so that they can, provided there is enough nutrient, temperature, pH and moisture, which can, you know, increase the uh, growth of such species. So you can, once you know what are the activities of microbes, you can just play with them, provided uh, you maintain the conditions. And so, so, so it is important to know what activities is associated with these uh, microbes. Thank you. And in case of uh, MICP, what uh, Sir Shank had discussed, so we know that bacillus, um, that species will produce urease and then you can get the uh, biocementation done. So in case you can find some organism, uh, tomorrow from here, you, if we isolate something and then if we go back to the gene and then find out it belongs to this same particular species, particular group, you don't know, you might end up with a new organism which shows a better MICP than the one which is used worldwide. So that's why you require you go to uh, study this evolutionary relationships. Uh, what we do is, I didn't go much into the detail of this. There is a particular technique where uh, last time I had told you about DNA, right? So in that, there is a particular uh, gene which codes for 16S rRNA. So it, it is called as 16S DNA, okay? So that gene, it is through, throughout the evolution, evolution particularly in my, uh, bacteria, it is very conserved. It has not gone much, it, it has not uh, gone much mutation. It is very conserved. If slight mutation in that, then it's a new family. So you have to isolate when you uh, take the bacteria, what, what I have shown now. So you have to isolate it. You will isolate a DNA from that and then there is sequencing done. So there is um, uh, PCR machines where you do this sequencing of all this. Then there comes the uh, importance of bioinformatics. So computational tools. There are many softwares, softwares written particularly for this. And there you put all the, uh, you have 10 bacteria and you have to find out whether it is same or whether it is different. You have to put all the data into that and that gives this tree. It's millions. Species is millions. There are, and whatever we have is, I mean, it's just one person data what we have of the complete micro uh, bacteria, what, uh, what is present in this universe. That way we just see, uh, you, uh, for example, because you asked, I'm telling you, this is Bacillus sephensis, okay. This is the one which we isolated in our lab, YUSS SB23. So after the sequencing, after the computation um, and the software and we finally got the result, before, before that we, we didn't know to which species it belonged to. So after this, af uh, we got to know it belongs to the bacillus sequences. So there is a gen bank and there is, uh, you can... Uh, just log into NCBI database. It's a database. So where there are all the uh, uh, genes present in that. So it's the data of all the genes are present. So if you take your human gene, if you take some, uh, some, uh, uh, you can just check for humans are related to donkeys or chimpanzees or whatever. So with where you are more related, you can find in that website. So you put, you take the human gene and you just compare it with different uh, organisms and you can get this kind of tree. So this shows that this is 100% similar. And here this shows that this group 
and this group is 92% similar. Okay, now uh, when uh, all these all are all these bacteria culturable, what do you say? Think whatever are present in the universe, all you can culture it by providing whatever nutrient you have said, carbon and temperature. It's only one percent what we have cultured till now is only one percent, and 99 percent are not culturable. Yeah, it is because of that. See, it, these bacteria it goes to another stage where you cannot. It becomes inviable. You cannot culture it at all. So once you cannot, it is surviving there. But if you take it and culture, you cannot provide those kind of uh, temperature or those kind of environment for that. In in case you can provide, I think to some extent you can culture it. So for example, if you are isolating it from a hot spring, how will you culture it? And when you get it out of that, it becomes inviable. It's like a chemical. When you just remove it, in most of the so that's why, and we have not found out an uh, media where we can cult, uh, culture it. So I think at if some point of time we we can find out some media for that because whatever we know, we know about cults, carbon source, nitrogen source, and phosphorus source, etc. But there are so many bacteria which require some other source. I mean, in the carbon, it requires some some other carbon source. So some can just live on iron. You have seen um, the um, where you uh, what is it called uh, the pipelines where it is corroded by bacteria. So bacterial action can do that. So there are some organisms which can survive on that. So when I was working in uh, Porto. So I could see some organisms where they could uh, grow it on the steel. I would like to add one more point. Uh, the surveys that we had collected from uh, Krishna Godavari Beijing, which was almost 300 meters uh, down beneath the ocean bed, out of curiosity, we had taken a bit of the sample to the ESAM, uh, electron ESAM lab, electron scanning electron microscopy. So out of that, we were able to see some micro colonies, some microbial colonies in this particular sediment. So, if, if you ask to culture this particular sample, whether are we able to give the situation which is existing at that particular location? Because it is anaerobic completely, right? Something which is two to three meters beneath the ocean bed is completely anaerobic in nature. Now, providing anaerobic nature itself is a big question. Now, we have identified seven colonies of bacteria, different varieties, different sizes, different shapes, and all those things. So, out of curiosity, we were able to see all those things. But we asked to culture it, which is a big question. What were the conditions which are remaining for the whatever uh, request and all those things? It becomes a bit of a question. Technology will do it in the sense how far you can uh, make it. You are not even sure whether these bacteria are alive or not. Yes. We have seen the quality, we have taken an image of that. Now, who knows whether it is its heart is beating or not? And I have uh, told you, I think, uh, during Shashank's class that uh, there it can go to a dormant stage. It can produce form and it can just survive for years. But to come to life, it requires particular condition. So you don't know. It might be in such state. So whatever scientists till now, they have isolated. Whatever you have asked, how many kind of families are there? And all these are just one person. So there is 99% which is hidden, so which uh, like people are thriving to work on that. So now Antarctica, so Antarctica has got so many kind of microbes. It is impossible for us to provide such kind of environment here. So the Yellowstone National Park in US, I think it is a uh, very hottest place. So it's, uh, it's very, uh, so you can find the bacteria over there. So it's because all the bacteria are not culturable and now when I say uh, the diversity of, uh, of microbes in a particular organism, you cannot culture everything, then how will you um, find out uh, what kind of bacteria are there? So just the general view, how can you get? Do you have any idea of that? But you are almost there. Um, so there is a method, uh, it's a new approach, metagenomics. 
so, so in this approach see uh, one is culture dependent what i said now so what you can culture and you take the dna and you find which organism and you use them for some particular application and all those things the second method is called as uh, culture independent so this is a new molecular biology technique where you take the soil or you take the water and then you isolate dna directly you are not culturing it so here you had to cult culture and then isolate but here in this case you directly isolate the nucleic acid and then you follow the same step so in this case you will find a complete diversity of that region whatever it is whatever micro uh, whatever microbes or whatever bacteria it is there not only the culturables but that but that you have to remember that when you get the over all total diversity it includes the non culturables you are you cannot just culture that so now you uh, for example um, so in this uh, if, uh, in a uranium contaminated zone so now there are some papers uh, where i think iit kharagpur they are working on this uh, region where uh, from jedgudda mine so it it can it has uranium there so uranium uh, ore there they have seen the overall bacterial diversity so what kind of bacteria are there and what might have uh, what kind of bacteria they can use in some regions which is contaminated with uranium so uh, the uranium processing unit will have the mine tailings what organisms they can use from that region so in case if you have an organism where you have cultured you can directly take it and put it there but in this case you know this organism belongs to this family but you don't have an organism in hand so that but in that case if you have a particular gene so to do this phylogenesis genetic you have to have this nucleic acid you can take this particular gene and put it into another bacteria what we have discussed about genetically modified organisms last week so that way you can use this use this technique you so you can come to uh, now in uh, another application i can say is you have devised a method you have worked you have uh, researched and finally you have devised a method to clean up an environment so to clean up municipal solid waste for example or which contains iron for example and you um, but you add your bacteria in the lab scale studies it works very fine but when you put it into the uh, region you could not uh, get the uh, whatever result you wanted so what might be the reason for that any anyway, uh, so in the lab scale it showed a but good yeah but here it was not working can there be something we had discussed about interaction of bacteria with that can you just give some i yes so and so where wherever uh, this or uh, iron is getting reduced something might oxidize it and come back it is coming back to the same state so there this metagenomics approach will help so you can if you come to know the complete organism which is present in that region so while applying while doing the application you can just think of if i add this so these kind of organisms are there i cannot use this mechanism so you have to go for another mechanism so this is all these are fundamental studies but it has got lot of applications so next is you go for elucidation of microbial interaction so microbe interaction i mean microbe and your contaminant or your metal or anything so after finding a phylogenetic analysis we go for this so what kind of microbial interaction can be there what are the different microbial interaction can be there with environment or what uh, with the metal particularly contaminant as uh, so these microbes can interact in a different ways so one is like it can so if there is some metal so it can either absorb it to its uh, cell wall 
or to its membrane it can take it inside and it can release something so that the metal gets immobilized so that it can get precipitated the same thing what it happens in micp so it releases enzyme and in some degradation it even then it releases some enzyme so all these processes happens processes follow it can release some uh, exopolysaccharide which can complex with the metal complex with the contaminant so all these are microbial interactions what is happening so even the uh, micro plant interaction it is the same so this picture i am not going much into that so now till here we do the lab studies how these interact and then once it is interacted we want to see the final product and to see what mechanism has worked to see so your iron has got reduced or your iron has got precipitated for these we go for all these analytical techniques like ftir sem and xrd so ftir have anyone heard of ftir in this technique in this uh, analysis you will come to know uh, for example i will uh, just brief you with uranium so that i can take it till here you have your uranium in the um, uh, liquid form so you have your organism and then you add that organism to this so it starts precipitating because this organism releases something the uranium what was in the soluble form started precipitating now finally you have to see you have to prove that whatever precipitated is uranium right so that is what required in research so for that you go uh, for these analysis so ftir is one where it it gives the peak for a particular group so example c the peak at 970 tells that it it is phosphate group and that peak is because of the anti symmetrical stretching of this phosphate of this bond and peak at 545 tells that there is phosphate group present and this peak at 921 tells that there is uranium uranium present so these for the any uh, any precipitate or i think ftir can also be used for the liquid samples so it tells what kind of uh, uh, the peak tells what kind of bond is present what kind of metal especially the bond is present so anyone wants to add anything about ftir no. ha huh, these are the uh, here it is the nanometer what you see you have you used the uv spectrophotometer no so it this this is given by that instrument and this these are already there is a database there is a library for this peak this peak means this bond is present so phosphate bond there is a particular one for car uh, is a wavelength or what what yeah it's a wavelength yes ah uh, that is the, that's the signature uh, these ftir peaks are signature for each uh, chemical compound you can say so it but tells about if there is water you see a peak at around i, uh, I if i'm not wrong it is around 1300 or so if there is water in a sample so for each one there it gives a particular peak now once we come to know see i will just know this once i give for or you in case in future if you give for some ftir analysis you will get just get this then you have to study through the literature what peak was for what so i got a peak at 970 is there any literature which shows at 970 what peak uranium phosphate can be many uh, different compounds there are like there can be two phosphate there can be two uranium so it's the playing with the chemistry so now each uranium phosphate it might vary so it will be a range uh, you are asking you get this kind of peak and you get an excel sheet where what your peak is yes so then you just you don't uh, uh, usually put the excel sheet in your result you just put this peak and then you will come to know exactly where it is 
So now the next sample when I give it can be at 922 also, but it still means the same. And here before that briefly you will have an idea because you have put an uranium, it should be uranium phosphate. It can, which one? So here it gives the transmittance, percent transmittance. So uh, here the higher the peak, the more uh, pre, uh, like more uh, bond is present. So it gives the percentage transmittance. Access, access is, is the wavelength. And then this is one more uh, uh, analytical technique where you use SEM. What just now uh, Mr. Jeevan had discussed about the soil sam the sample, the soil sample, right? So this is scanning electron microscopy images. This, have you uh, seen this or read about this scanning SEM? ESEM or so these you through the when you do this ESEM you take your precipitate the same thing FTIR here but you take your uh, uh, for the this and ESEM analysis you will come to know the structure of that so this structure uh, through this structure I could say it is a plate like stru structure which through in the literature it showed that it is uranium phosphate soil samples which were collected from a very great depth and we had shown that there were some microbial colonies, fungi and bacterial chains and all uh, which I said is scanning electron microscopy. So these are the same images which, uh, which I had shown over there and she is explaining it in a bit of more detail I guess over here. So they have already heard about SEM. So that is what you take this the same precipitate and when you find out this everything you have to uh, it the uh, instrument does not tell you see the this kind of element is present or this this structure means uh, this thing is present this bacteria is, is present you have to have a thorough literature survey for everything. So you have to go to the literature and then you should find out so these kind of uh, structure where was it is it reported before and if it is rep reported before then you can tell okay um, so it is uranium phosphate so uranium phosphate the chemistry people have worked on and they have not by bi biological mode they had added they have done some chemical experiment and they had found out this kind of structure and so where I use my bacteria the same kind of structure was found. So and you cannot say because of one analytical tool you cannot say you cannot confirm it you have to have many different analytical tools. Now I think tomorrow if you have to do some uh, analysis like this and here if you go to SEM we have our Agnes there and she will just give you the picture of this and she will never tell you this organism or this element is present, right. Now the next one, see this uh, SEM is uh, attached to EDAX, so that tells you what element is present. Um, so in, in you can see here the peak which tells, in this it tells you uranium, phosphate and oxygen. So the SEM Im, uh, images uh, the SEM instrument is attached to this EDAX. So it tells you exactly what percentage. Now you say usually when you go to uh, uh, gold shop, people say it is 916. So it is so much percentage. So and I think there are some uh, gold shops where you they, they say you can come and check your gold quality. 916. So they use this EDAX. So they've just put your uh, ring or anything and they have a, a pointer. So it just tells what are the percentage you get the peak like this. That's nothing else than EDAX. So then this is another technique where which finally shows this XRD. 
x ray diffraction spectrum it finally shows you uh, what mineral is formed so here it is very uh, the um, signature peaks it is so in this once you get this you have to once again go to the literature and find out exactly at what uh, uh, here it gives in degrees and this is the intensity at what intensity of what degrees it has given shown the peak and then you relate it what well, this is uh, yeah a different uranium concept but the uh, the full peak and whatever uh, precipitate i had was chernikovite it is a kind of uranium phosphate precipitate see till here i could just say it is uranium phosphate and even with this i could just say it is uranium phosphate but once i did this i could make tell that is uranium phosphate and particularly it is chernikovite so there are different in autonite you just put uranium phosphate there are different kinds of chemi uh, minerals in that so you can yes you have yes yes no chernikovite is your final uh, what i whatever i say the precipitate is formed uh, it's a mineral chernikovite is a mineral then it's a uranium phosphate mineral Je belongs to a uranium phosphate generally you can say it uranium phosphate but i wanted to know what exactly it is so then you do these analysis which finally tells you that oh uh, okay uh, you mean now to see the structure what you what uh, analysis you do yeah see in case you want to know the structure of uh, organism or structure of any thing the outside structure so you can go for sem sem analysis right for that the sem is done i think yeah. is such a texture uh, even there is a scaling provided so you can just compare the scaling and but we get a rough estimation of the size of the uh, entity also basically morphological studies which comes and it acts as there so we can find the composition of it also
so now in case in the liquid sample you have to find out so uh, for example water so what elements are present so what you have any idea what uh, yes so in the same way for you uv spec you can use so all these are the analytical techniques you have to know what you want and then you have to uh, find like uh, uh, select a technique so there are different but you have to know your final results so you want an image or you are just seeing the um, morphology or you want to see the internal structure also so then you have to go for a higher uh, um, atomic force microscope or something like that so it's completely based on what you need so there are different techniques available so this is so till here the lab studies usually the lab studies ends here so once this is done you just want it to apply to the field right whatever you do is finally for the application you you just select a site and you want to know but as a biotechnologist we are not well versed with field application so i think there we will throw the balls to your co coat so that is where we uh, i mean the this kind of research the environmental uh, uh, biotechnology or what requires the um, apply i mean the help of the geotechnologists or the civil engineers because now if you tell me you can put 1 meter or i am not really i don't know anything i can say so but so what i had told you last time so once i joined the team i could know where i could use their expertise to my phd work so this is where i stopped but now i think if i had someone there in my team a civil engineer or a geotechnologist they could have guided me okay you can take this much of plot and then you can see the you know, how much strength and you can add so much of microbes and then you can just check it right so this here we are required to come together and work for any kind of um, problem to solve this problem and you have to remember one more thing is there is this classic issue encountered when working with bacteria so in that microbial processes are slow it's unpredictable especially so why why is it unpredictable first of all it is living organism so it can change so now today you eat uh, some fruit and you are fine but tomorrow you eat the same fruit you can you say i have got heat you i had papaya more and i have heat so the same thing so these are living organisms so it is very diff i mean it is very complex so that's why you can get the result in the lab scale studies and it is very uh, difficult to expand it to the real life situation to the environment so but come with coming uh, i mean uh, merging with all the fields all the expertise we can overcome these kind of complexities and i want to quote this here because i was saying about the complexity so molecular biology has shown that even the simplest of all living systems on the earth today bacterial cells are exceedingly complex ob objects although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small weighing less than 10 to 12 grams each is in effect a veritable micro miniaturized factory containing thousand of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up of all together of 100000 million atoms far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non living world so this shows how complex the even the tiny cell which you cannot see the microbes just imagine if you could have seen the microbes everywhere today i was just seeing a video you could just see the microbes roaming all over your body everywhere you could you would not touch it it's not it's not beautiful you know that if you want you uh, come with me to microbiology department i'll show you the microbes 
So due to this complexity, the microbial uh, geotech would require an integration of all these fields, microbiology, ecology, geochemistry, geotechnical engineering, everything. So this is the importance of the objective of this class or of this uh, course especially. And I think with this, we can bridge the gap between the biotechnologist and the geotechnologist.